Um, and before I give all of David's uh, qualifications and impressive uh, resume, I just want to tell you a quick story. Um, I arrived at Oxford uh, from Montreal to do my graduate studies, and I remember in the uh, cafeteria, uh, the first time I met you, um, I was sort of, a, I guess, a fish out of water. I came from a very tight-knit Jewish community in Montreal, and suddenly I found myself in this sort of very staid, quiet, uh, Anglo-Saxon proper uh, dining room. It was very foreign to me. And I just met David quickly at a seminar, and we said hello. And I was getting my food, it was one of the first few days, and David was way across the dining hall, this huge uh, palatial room, but you could hear a pin drop, nobody really spoke loudly over meals, it was very quiet. And David stood up across the room and he started saying, hey, Charles. <laughs> and it was really a breath of fresh air uh, for me, sort of a, you know, a, a familiar uh, voice, as I'm saying. He discovered, we, uh, he discovered a lot of Yeah, a lot of them. Uh, a real one. And, <laughs> And so it was a pleasure to, to know David at Oxford. It was a breath of fresh air to have his friendship there. And all these years later, it's really a privilege to, uh, to welcome you here. So many of you know David and his important work. He's currently the editor of DefendingHistory.com. He's a chief analyst for Litvak Studies, the Litvak Studies Institute in Vilnius. Um, He's a chief analyst at the uh, Lipex Studies in Vilnius, which is part of the university? No, no. Independent. Very much. Okay. He's an honorary research associate at the Department of Hebrew and Jewish Studies at the University, at university College of London. He's a doctoral supervisor in Yiddish Studies in Vatatis. Vitautas. Vitautas. Ah. Magnus University in Kaunas. Um, and he's an independent researcher and scholar. He started a very important uh, research center in, in Vilnius in, in the Yiddish Studies Institute. Uh, in 2001 to 2002, he was the John Simon Guggenheim Fellow in Yiddish Literature. He was the director of, Yiddish, of the Yiddish Education Program at Vilnius uh, Yiddish Institute and the director and co-founder of the SLS Jewish Lithuanian Program. And he also ran a program at Yarnton in, uh, in Oxford. Uh, he is the author of many published books and articles. He's published more than 16 books. He's a columnist uh, for many magazines and international academic journals. So it's really Thank wonderful to have you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's always wonderful me to, for me to come back here to Yale, to New Haven, where I remember a beautiful year spent. I want to say hi to Rachel Weisner and to anyone else who may remember our, our year together. And uh, I always want to remember my dear friend, Dr. Uh, Donald Cohn, who's not with us, and who was so kind and inspiring to so many of the things I went on to do after the year at Yale. Well, the topic today is the unique and successful anti-Semitism in the east of the European Union. In other words, those states that are part of the European Union and NATO that are the new accession states that have been part of the Warsaw Pact or the Soviet Union or the Soviet sphere prior to collapse of the Soviet Union. In other words, the democratic states, the good guys in the new uh, East-West uh, configuration. Um, oh, sorry, let me get my hand on that. What is successful anti-Semitism? Well, in the pre-modern sense, it would be, you know, how many more Jews can you can you kill or, or hurt or, or expel or baptize or defame? Um, but now, this is all much more sophisticated. And there is a new kind of anti-Semitism that is spreading from Eastern Europe westward and that is very successful. First of all, it is described or it is presented as being constructive, nationalist, nation-building, egalitarian, these guys have to build up their national identity. Well, and if they participated in the Holocaust, we have to somehow cover that up or change that. They need their national narrative like anyone else. So let's not talk about anti-Semitism when it comes up in that context. Or the kind of anti-Semitism that's just one historic issue, which is inevitably and invariably the Holocaust. And just one small group of Jews, which is always the remnant Jewish community here, in other words, something I've heard hundreds, if not thousands, of times in my 12 years of being based in Vilnius and 20 years of going there is, 
Oh, we love you. We love American Jews and British Jews and Israelis. A shame about those Jews here. They're all, you know, pro-Russian and communist. They're not patriotic. What a great shame about them. And many Western Jews, well, you know, they, it can be presented in a way that's not offensive. Finally, a successful anti-Semitism is the one that is covered up so successfully that Western, Jewish, Israeli scholars, organizations can be persuaded to come on board. Come on board doesn't mean that they will join and become anti-Semites like that, but they will cover for it by coming for Jewish studies conferences, Holocaust conferences, and turn a blind eye to the local anti-Semitism. So that's what I mean by successful anti-Semitism. Now, many scholars have studied this phenomenon of anti-Semitism in Eastern Europe. Um, this, this could have perhaps been better presented as two separate lists, those in the early 90s who first understood what was happening and wrote about it, like uh, Fryum Zorov, Robert Wistrich, uh, Randolph Brahm, and he edited that wonderful book in 1994, and um, Deborah Lipstadt in her book uh, Denying, uh, Denying History, uh, has one page on the future of Holocaust denial where she does have a few very, very prophetic lines. And then there are the recent academic studies, some of the same people, Zoroff and Wistrich, and some new ones, Don Donskis and Clemens Henning, who I think some of you here know from his time at Yale. Who, so in other words, there's two groups of scholars, those who wrote about the beginning of the phenomenon and those who now have uh, seen it come to fruition and have described it in scholarly terms. This is a very small group. I've left out a few, but it's still a small group, and the phenomenon is not yet accepted as even existing. It's often thought of as somehow just some kind of pet thing by these, uh, this small group. Now, what is the Eastern European Union narrative about World War II? In short, it's double genocide. In 1940, the Soviets committed genocide against us, and they were mostly Jews, and we know that all Jews are communists. And in 1941, we, the Baltic peoples, the Lithuanians, the Latvians, the Estonians, helped the Nazis commit their genocide. 1940 comes before 1941, but now we're in reconciliation by being open with each other and, see each other and seeing each other's pain and the Holocaust is deleted from the narrative without denying a single death. In diplomatic circles in Europe, the code word is red-brown or red equals brown, okay? So two diplomats in Brussels will talk about, is that a red-brown solution? Is there any red-brown stuff in that document, in that proclamation? So that's the new language that I think is not really known here in, the, in, in America yet. So Holocaust denial, in Europe at least, is no longer respectable. Since the famous Lipstadt Irving trial in the spring of 2000, when Deborah Lipstadt won, Professor Deborah Lipstadt of Emory University, won her, uh, the, the libel uh, action, the action brought against her by Holocaust denier David Irving, and Lord Justice Gray uh, gave his very well-worded uh, judgment, Holocaust denial was pushed to the fringes. In Eastern Europe, meanwhile, scholars, governments, elites, journalists were working on a new movement that we call Holocaust obfuscation. Now, if that's not a very sexy term and it's confusing and not clear, that's good because it, re it revolves around the idea of confusing the issue. Everybody was killing everybody, everything is equal. Get rid of the Holocaust that way without denying a single death, but you get rid of it as a category and as a concept. Now, we have to talk a little bit about the history here, the Baltic Holocaust. The percentages of Jewish citizens killed in the Baltic countries were the highest in Holocaust-era Europe, around 95% in all three Baltic countries, although numbers, absolute numbers, of course, far smaller than in the larger countries uh, uh, around them, certainly to the West. Um, uh, going back to my still ongoing work as a Yiddish dialectologist, I always bring people a period map from their youth. So 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I was still bringing them maps of Tsarist, the Tsarist Empire. But now I'm dealing exclusively with people who grew up in the 1920s and 1930s. So we're talking about the interwar map. So that's Lithuania, Latvia, and the whole Vilna area uh, is part of Poland. 
Okay, and that was a point of contention between Lithuania and Poland, which had no diplomatic relations till 38, and that was the worst border, or one of the worst borders in Europe at the time, with a very big no man's land. That will become relevant, that's why I'm mentioning it. Now, this is the northern section of the molotov ribbentrop line of 23, or early 24, August 1939, and it's again superimposed on a period map. So theoretically, according to the Nazi-Soviet agreement, Hitler would take everything from the west up to that line, and Stalin would take everything from the east up to that line. Well, Hitler certainly took his part, but something strange happened. The Soviet army very kindly stopped at the borders of the three Baltic states and said, oh, we respect the independence of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. Of course, it was all a dirty trick to to uh, win them without bloodshed and trouble, uh, with a, with a, a long, with, with trickery, that they allowed independent, they allowed them to stay unoccupied, but they, the Soviets insisted on stationing troops uh, in in these countries. And then a month later, in October, the Soviets said to the Lithuanians, "Hey, guess what? You and the Poles were fighting over that city, Vilna." No problem, it's yours. There is no more Poland anyway. You want to call it Vilnius, tomorrow it'll be Vilnius. And not only Vilnius, but the Vilnius region was ceded to Lithuania. This is a slight simplification because part of this area was ceded only later in, in late 1940 as a gift from the Soviet people to Lithuania for having voted for uh, incorporation in the Soviet Union. That's the fake elections of June 1940 when the Baltic states were incorporated uh, into the Soviet Union, making that original plan uh, uh, eventually come true. In the meantime, the Nazis had set up Jewish ghettos with, with horrific humiliation and persecution and pillage of, of Jews based on, on race, religion, and ethnicity. The Soviets imposed Soviet law, and Jews suffered perhaps disproportionately for Many of them were shopkeepers, and therefore there was a higher percentage of bourgeoisie to be sent to Siberia for being exploiters. There was a crackdown on religion. Yeshivas were closed, and um, uh, Hebrew schools were closed. Yiddish schools were transformed from the rich Yiddish tradition of independent Eastern Europe to the watered-down and politically uh, overrun Soviet Yiddish. But there was basic racial equality. In my interviews over the years, I've heard hundreds of times the first thing the Soviets did when they came is they said there'd be a fine for saying the word zhid in public. Wow, for the first time it's illegal to use an anti-Jewish epithet. So um, it, it was a very complex situation, but certainly no genocide, no uh, mass murder. Um, then, of course, with the um, incorporation of the three Baltic republics, um, that original Molotov-Ribbentrop line became true in 1940. And it was during this time that a hysterical anti-Semitism was developing against the Jews in all three Baltic countries as somehow being complicit in this. In many memoirs, for example, Lithuanian memoirs, you see, we were all very uncomfortable, but the Jews somehow adjusted better, and in their heart of hearts, they were happy that it didn't fall to Hitler, which is completely true. So you come to that Christian concept of the sin of the heart, that even a rabbi who lost his yeshiva and could no longer practice was still, and, and for whom the dirtiest word in the Yiddish language was Bolshevik, was nonetheless uh, relieved that his town and area and country did not fall to the Nazis. All this time, a trickle of stream of refugees was coming from the Nazi-occupied sector to the Soviet-occupied sector eastward, telling people what had happened. Then comes the Nazi invasion, Operation Barbarossa, 22nd of June, and the widespread murder of Jewish civilians starts in Lithuania and Latvia even before Nazi control is firmly established. There are hundreds and hundreds of documented cases of violence, rape, murder, dismemberment of people in the middle of towns up and down Lithuania and parts of Latvia, not all of Latvia. And in Lithuania, in eastern uh, Lithuania, this did not happen. It was central and western. In other words, the pre-1939 borders of Lithuania where, where this happened. Now, to get to jump ahead, we're going to see that one of the problems today is that 
many of these murderers are being glorified as anti-Soviet resistance heroes who drove the Soviets out, which is complete nonsense. The Soviets were running from the German uh, invasion. Now, what's going on now about all of that? And I, I want to pause here to make a very personal comment. I've lived among the Lithuanian people for a dozen years. I have found them to be warm, friendly, open, tolerant. So my comments about the elite, the government, the academics, and the press should not be mistaken as relating to the Lithuanian people in general. I think they are victims of a very misguided government policy, and many of the brightest young people in the Baltics are voting with their feet by fleeing to the West. They can now get jobs in Western Europe, not only without a visa, but without even a passport, with just an ID card. And it's very sad that the Baltic countries have lost so much of their youth, not because of this, but this is part, uh, as we will see, of the reason, because a government that invests so much in revision of history and raises it to the level of a foreign policy priority uh, is certainly not um, providing the freedom of debate that we think is necessary in, in democratic societies. So we got the idea that the Holocaust is going to be neutralized via the red-brown equation. Everything is the same. Everybody was killing everybody. It, there was such time. Let's count the bodies and so on. Now, um, this started big time in January of 2008 with five members of the European Parliament from um, five East European countries holding a conference in Tallinn, Estonia. They, and, and this was the start of it. Common Europe, common history. Now the documents of this conference claim that Europe can never be united unless all of Europe agrees to the same history. You have a different history, a different version in your country, Europe's not going to be united. I think this is total nonsense, replacing freedom and the symphony of different competing ideas with a government and now a pan-European uh, truth being proposed. So what is needed above all is an equal evaluation of the two large criminal regimes of the 20th century, Nazism and Communism. Then there was a sentence in the press release that even in the European Union, the famous words never again are not insured for victims of communism. In other words, Holocaust survivors have somehow usurped this phrase, never again. We have to do something about that, as if that's you know, a major European problem. Um, I want to pay tribute to a member of the British Parliament, John Mann, who's one of the founders of the uh, Cross-Party Committee Against Anti-Semitism. Uh, He's a straight Englishman, and he represents a district that has virtually no ethnic minorities of any kind. And he had been following this before any of us knew what was going on. He got up in the House of Commons in the British Parliament a week later, on the 31st of January, and you can see what he said. On the 22nd of January, in Tallinn, Estonia, five MEPs from five different countries met to launch a group called Common Europe, Common History, it has the same theme, the need for an equal evaluation of history. It's just a traditional form of prejudice rewritten in a modern context. And then between the lines, MP John Mann saw that you just have to scratch one of those East European politicians to hear that the Jews were all communists and, and got what they deserved, or that they were the major participants in Soviet atrocities. So. Um, he got it right, that it's a nationalist point of view, and he's shocked that they're elected MEPs. Um, in June 2008, many more people came to a conference to proclaim the Prague Declaration, which has, um, takes the whole thing much further. It demands an overhaul of European history textbooks so that communism and Nazism are taught the same way. Um, there are very many points. We could do a whole hour about the Prague Declaration, just two more examples. That, the, that at the moment communist victims are second class uh, victims and we have to uh, equalize their victimhood as if a, a, a people who's completely murdered can be equalized with people who've been deported and many of whom came back. That is the problem in all this, of course, that they're not equal. Um, and finally, the demand for a Nuremberg Tribunal great um, process or trial to make sure that communism is put on the same um, position is in the same position as Nazism in European history. Now, they didn't talk about replacing Holocaust Remembrance Day, but that was 
that would be the result if this part of it came uh, to be enacted by the European Parliament to have a mixed Remembrance Day on the 23rd of August for victims of Nazi and Soviet crimes, which would, of course, emphasize the stalin Hitler pact and, of course, say nothing about uh, the Soviet uh, resistance against Nazism from 41 to 45 in alliance with the United States, Britain, Canada, and the Allies. So those are some of the issues. By 2009, this was spreading beyond Europe. There was a big conference of the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in Vilnius in late June, early July 2009. And it's a very long document, and only two little phrases were snuck in, but you know it was snuck in. Double genocide language is a reference to Nazi and Soviet genocide, as if this is a totally accepted uh, equation, and the proposal for an international red-brown memorial day on August 23rd, not just European. As it happens, I had the honor of entertaining a group of senators and congressmen uh, in my apartment that week. I had no idea that this language was being put in. They had been taken to an an a conference on anti-Semitism, where for six hours proclamations were read out about how we condemn anti-Semitism, so they felt very proud that they had joined they had signed all the proclamations against anti-Semitism without noticing that this is being slipped in under the radar because everybody will always have more important problems than history. So even small, poor countries who decide to invest treasure can get very far if they're investing the budget in, in the uh, revision of history. So it's being driven by... Um, the three Baltic countries, no matter what party that their factions in Parliament come from, but also by the right wing in Poland, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and other uh, larger states of the Eastern European Union. In other words, in the Baltics, it's a consensus view. In the other countries, it's the right wing view because the other countries still have debate on these issues. Okay. And the very touchy point that's also just under the surface is that in the Baltics, as in Western Ukraine, collaboration does not mean writing to the Gestapo that somebody is hiding in the attic. It means thousands and thousands of people, and cumulatively in these countries, volunteering to do the shooting of their neighbors. And if you look at the list in Lithuania and Latvia of the shooters in each town, shockingly you see the local dentist, a driver, a guard, or in a few cases a priest. So, it is uh, very far from a situation of the Nazis having found a couple of drugs to help. Um, now, a lot of this has to do with populist politics. If you ask simple people in villages, nobody will deny the Holocaust. Um, there were no concentration camps or gas chambers uh, in the Baltics. Uh, for, uh, by and large, there were hundreds of shooting sites. And every town almost in Lithuania has a pit outside, so everybody knows what happened. It's a question of explaining it. They were all NKVD, that's the precursor to the KGB. They were all disloyal, 1940 came before 1941, Jewish communists were the real mass murderers, and so forth. Now the fancy politicians today don't say this, but they are pandering to this important part of the electorate which becomes more important each year as progressive younger people migrate or just don't vote. Uh, I want to pay tribute to the very bold Lithuanians who, have, who stood up in the 1990s to tell the truth to their people the way we all do when we love our country, because all our countries have historic stains. Who can study American history and, and not talk about what America did to African Americans, to Native Americans? The one such person in Lithuania is my good friend Linas Viljunas. He founded an NGO called the House of Memory and um, did wonderful, wonderful work in education. This is a series of books based on essay competitions of kids who were asked to speak to their grandparents, my, Jewish, my grandparents' Jewish neighbors, um, and what happened to those neighbors. So, uh, in other words, a completely, completely honest approach to history. And of course, Thomas Wenzelhoff, your own professor here, he was telling the truth from the 1970s onward in exile here in the United States. And um, up to the present, his most recent article is a couple of weeks ago, he has been a stalwart pillar of truth in a very, very difficult uh, 
situation. He's attacked in the press and on the internet mercilessly. Now, in the early 90s, there was progress. That's President Algirdas Brazauskas, a social democrat, with Holocaust historian Dov Levin, who's now in his mid-80s, and Dr. Ephraim Zorov, um, the head of the Israel branch of the uh, Wiesenthal Center. And progress was being made on war criminals, on the teaching of history. So there was an auspicious start. But the state's establishment uh, turned against all these efforts. And all these NGOs were sidelined. Their funding was cut off by various intrigues. Zoroff or Zoroff Fasil Lithuanian became a curse word. I was telling Charles over coffee that um, that, you know, um, when I came to Lithuania, people told me they liked me because I'm not Zoroff, and I didn't know who Zoroff was. <laughs> so I sure found out. Um, now, what happened here? In every big mess, like in a messy divorce, there's always more than one guilty party. The Western countries and the Jewish organizations made a very big, big mistake, in my opinion. Um, in the late 90s, they started pressuring the Baltic countries, saying, you want to join NATO and the European Union? You're going to have to come to terms with the Holocaust as a government. They should have been pouring money into all those honest NGOs and efforts to build Holocaust education from sincere people. The government, meanwhile, with the academics and the journalists and the elite, were cooking up the double genocide theory to teach Holocaust studies and tell the truth about the number of deaths as part of the new field of genocide or double genocide studies, which is a cover term for there was no separate Holocaust. It was just a period of massive bloodshed in this area. So um, that was the mistake. Um, in the case of Lithuania, the government invests in four, or has invested in four very, very lavishly financed institutions. The Genocide and Resistance Research Center, the Museum of Genocide Victims in the former KGB building in the center of Vilnius. One of the most popular tourist attractions, the Lenin Park, where statues of Lenin and other Soviet figures were gathered to an educational park. And finally, the state-sponsored International Commission for the Evaluation of the Crimes of the Nazi and Soviet Occupation Regimes in Lithuania. Now, this is right out of George Orwell international for what needs to be discussed and revealed nationally. The parallelism and implied equality of the conclusion built into the title of the inquiry. Investigation of the occupation regimes not mentioning the local authorities. They can't be mentioned because they're heroes. Remember, they were fighting the Soviets. So now I, I do want to say any international, any finance commission that throws money at hundreds of academics will bring many good results also. So many fine scholarly things have been written under the auspices of the commission. But the commission's political role has been to spearhead the drive in Brussels and Strasbourg for the European resolutions on equality of Nazism and, and uh, Soviet uh, crimes. Um, that's a recent photograph of the window of the Genocide uh, Research Center. They're all books about the Soviet crimes, one or two about uh, Lithuanians, very brave people who saved you. One 60-page pamphlet about the Holocaust written by a local scholar in a very uh, nationalist tone. Um, so one out of 20 books in the window. By the way, that building, I maybe mean, you remember it, Rocho, on the corner of Glezer, Gessel, and Blake to Gas, it was the um, site of the gate to the first Vilna ghetto. That building divided free Vilna from the first Vilna ghetto whose, whose um, incarcerated Jews were doomed to, to all be shot within a few weeks uh, in the autumn of 1941. Uh, recently, a BBC journalist, Wendy Robbins, asked him, why don't you have a plaque on the you're a genocide center. Why don't you have a plaque about the role of your own building in the history of genocide in the city? And the answer was, oh, we believe in education, the kind of thing to be discussed in class. That was, that was the end of that one. Now we turn to the Museum of Genocide Victims in the center of town. There's a big brass plaque on a pole outside that explains correctly that this had been the building of the KGB where many awful things took place. Not one word about its having been Gestapo headquarters 
in Vilna during the Holocaust where the murders of 100,000 innocent civilians of Vilna and its, and its environs was being coordinated. 70,000 Jews, 30,000 non-Jews, Lithuanian and Polish and Russian people and Lithuanian, Polish and Russian communists, gay people, Roma, some old believers, um, so not, nothing about the genocide that actually occurred there, only about the genocide that didn't happen because there was no Soviet genocide in Vilnius. There were people killed, of course, there were many crimes. Um, this is a recent exhibit where a lady who claims to have been at Auschwitz and in the Ukrainian famine says, at Auschwitz we were given some spinach and a little bread. War is terrible, but famine is even worse. The only mention of Auschwitz in the entire museum. Uh, for some strange reason, after I put it up on the uh, internet, the exhibition was removed the next day. <laughs> um, these are some of the cartoons from the early 1950s from inside the museum, when many of the uh, so-called Forest Brothers, some of whom were brave resistance fighters against Soviet misrule, but others, thugs who simply killed Russian workers, Russian-speaking workers from other republics, and some recycled uh, Holocaust perpetrators from 1941. So this is one of their cartoons of the Soviet jeep being led by, I'm sorry it's not too clear here, but on defendinghistory.com you can find a, a clear version. It's led by Lenin, Stalin, and Zhidas Yankalis, the Jew Yankalis. This is after the Holocaust, okay? Um, or if Stalin and the rather Semitic looking uh, accomplice, they're getting their economic bubbles out of the bowl with a six-pointed star rather than the Soviet star. Okay, we come to that wonderful uh, uh, amusement park found Soviet sculpture, museum, picture gallery, events, cafes, souvenirs, Luna Park. What's a Luna Park? What's a Luna Park? What? Amusement Park. Amusement Park. Thank you, thank you. Amusement Park, zoo. Okay. Now, um, this is now privatized, but all the historic signs and captions come from the aforementioned genocide center. So, the, um, the only mention of, of um, resistance to the, the, the Nazis is, is here, Soviet activists, Red Army men, escaped prisoners of war, and some inhabitants of Lithuania, mostly of Jewish nationality, formed groups of saboteurs. Half of the members were people sent by the center they got. So the tiny number of Jews who did survive by escaping the ghetto to join the anti-Nazi resistance in the forest and our heroes of the free world are here being smeared as saboteurs in this very family-friendly, fun amusement park. And very many of the bad guys are chosen for their name, Abramovich or Lithuanian from Abramovich, Serapinovich, Serapinovich, but if the name is not clear, like Charnas, probably translated from Schwarz, Chodny in Slavic, born in Kaunas, nationality Jewish. So it's a rogue gallery of, of Jews with a comment and another sign that you can see on the website about the Jews being the backbone of communism. So what is the state's Red Brown Commission doing? It had sidelined the honest initiatives, retooled Holocaust studies into a component of equal genocide studies, and attracted massive Western and Jewish support and membership, uh, and certainly support of leading scholars. To, to get legitimacy, this commission had to have at least one Jewish scholar who was a Holocaust survivor himself. So they decided on Yitzhak Agad who uh, was born in 1926 in Svensjan, Svensjonis, 90 kilometers north of Vilna. He escaped the ghetto to join the partisans, entire family killed. In 1945, he emigrated to uh, then Palestine, a hero of the Israeli War of Independence, became a scholar, became the founding chairman or director of Yad Vashem later. Um, that's arrived during, his, during the good years when he would come to Vilna's for sessions of the commission, we would always entertain him and have fun with him, uh, as we do with all <laughs> East European-born Yiddish-speaking people. Now, in 2006, notice that the trouble starts after European Union and NATO accession in 2004. An article in the Respublica, which is supposed to be 
moderate, little bit left of center newspaper, the third largest in Lithuania, had a very big article, a whole page, an expert with blood on his hands, which is an interview with the state prosecutor who was supposed to be uh, the special prosecutor for war crimes, supposed to be running after Nazi war criminals, of whom not one was ever punished in Lithuania, says that Arad should be investigated. Now, I remember this was the first time in my many happy years in Lithuania that I was personally very upset, and all my friends said, David, calm down, it's a stupid newspaper, who the hell cares what a newspaper said? But only two months later, the prosecutor announced um, his war crimes investigation based on the same misquoted passages from the article. So it's the, the yellow anti-Semitic press leading the way for politicians and the prosecution service. The evidence, quote unquote, against Iraq is one page of his wonderful book, I highly recommend it, The Partisan, English edition, 1979, New York. It had nothing to do with him personally, but his unit captured a big German Nazi and killed him. Well, we knew that there were no um, courts and judges and lawyers and defense attorneys in the forest during the Holocaust. So why did you bring this guy to your commission if his unit did such a thing? So suddenly, and uh, among Holocaust survivors and, in the, and, and among Yiddish-speaking Jews, the Yiddish humor came into it, and they all started saying, ah, they are finally reading our memoirs. <laughs> Um, okay, then in 2008, at the beginning of 2008, the right-wing newspaper baited the prosecutor, it challenged his manhood, so to speak, saying, why don't you go after Fania Brantsovsky and Rojo Margolis? This was much more personal for me because both are very close and dear personal friends of mine. Fania was born in 1922 attended Yiddish schools and was in the Vilna ghetto from the first day to the last. She escaped a few hours before the ghetto was liquidated on September 23, 1943 and made it to the underground forest fort where she lived till liberation in 44. Fania escaped 10 minutes before the ghetto was encircled by Lithuanian auxiliary police uh, in anticipation of the liquidation a few hours later. So she and her friend Dr. Devoltov happily still alive and well in Los Angeles, made it to the forest fort. That's Fania and my grubby uh, fingers holding a picture of her father's shot before the war on Zavalnegas, um, Pilimo now. Um, that's Fania at the far left, her father Benjamin Yocheles who owned that shop, mother Rojo, little sister Rivale, and the photographer who jumped into the uh, timed photograph not quite in time, it's a little blurry, name unknown. They were all killed except Fania, as indeed all of Fania's family perished. Fania is the, the, the first row, bottom left, uh, the only survivor. And that's where Fania lived, in that uh, underground uh, bunker from September of 43 until uh, July 44. This was in fact a Jewish fort, 99 of its 102. Uh, occupants were escapees from the Vilna ghetto who were working with the Soviet partisans and had their own little fort here. So instead of being preserved as a magnificent testimony to human spirit for freedom and, and resistance, it's now being allowed to disappear completely from the elements because it's regarded as a bandit's fort of Soviet criminals. Um, now meet Rojo Margolis, who's now in the Rehovot, um, used to spend half a year in Israel, half a year in Vilna, born in 21. She turned 89 last October. She was a biology professor at Vilna's University for 43 years, but if you ask at Vilna's University now, every reference to her has been removed. Um, fascinating story, that's, that's Rojo, and that's, um, this is why she's so hated. She read it after the Soviet Union collapsed, she set up the one honest Holocaust exhibition in town called the Greenhouse and rediscovered the lost diary of Ponar, the mass murder site outside Vilna that was kept by the Christian Polish journalist Kazimierz Sakowicz. Pardon my Polish pronunciation. Sakowicz was born in 1894 in Vilna, was a Polish journalist when it became part of Lithuania in October 
of uh, 1940, 19, uh, 1939, he had the bright idea to retire, leave his apartment on the main boulevard, and buy a lovely villa in the fantastically beautiful forest of Ponar outside Vilna. And when the murder started there in July 1941, he saw everything in a direct line of sight from his attic window and kept a meticulous diary that was hidden in jars before he himself was killed. The Soviet army retrieved it and hid it in some secret archive. After the war, the two Yiddish poets, Shmerke Kaczerginski and Avram Zutzkava, who established a, a short-lived Jewish museum in Vilna, um, attracted Rocco Margolis and several other young people to come as volunteers, and they told her where this diary is to be found in the archive. Lo and behold, 50 years go by, she's still there, and she finds it, publishes it, or transcribes it, and publishes it in Polish. In, um, in 1999, and it came out, Yale University Press, 2005 in English, uh, Ponari Diary, edited by Yitzhak Arad. It sounds like touching this diary gets you in big trouble. In California. <laughs> At the same time, a major new outbreak of old-fashioned anti-Semitism, unchallenged by the state or intellectuals or local specialists in Jewish projects. Let me give you an example. There had been Nazi parades, neo-Nazi parades, fascist parades, skinhead parades before, as in many other countries, but not with a permit from the city on the main boulevard of the capital on Independence Day. That started in March 2008, the same time this other whole right, with di diplomatic and, uh, uh, and international di um, historic assault was underway. This uh, was starting. They chanted Juden Raus and the Lithuanian rhyme that translates take a stick and kill that little Jew. Uh, Lithuania for Lithuanians. Now, the leader is a skinhead, but many of the people on that parade were intellectuals uh, from political institutes. One of them uh, was, and I'm ashamed to say still is, a doctoral student in political science at the School of International Affairs. And that's when the Lithuanian swastika was introduced for popular use. The extra lines are supposed to uh, evoke um, the idea of the medieval pillars of Gedimin, or Gediminas, one of the great grand dukes of Lithuania. In the, thir in the early 1320s, he had founded Vilna, in fact, and is remembered by many of the peoples of the Lithuanian lands for inviting them and for having his multicultural uh, tolerant empire, of course, uh, in large measure due to paganism, which, as you all know, is much more tolerant than any of the monotheistic religions, right? If you, if you worship the stars and the moon and the tree, you're not going to kill somebody, yeah? Because Messiah came, he came once, he never came, he's going to come, he faces, that all of that <laughs> seems rather silly if you're an advanced pagan. So all that was replaced by 19th century nationalism for this crowd, the new sense of, the narrow sense of Lithuania. Um, now, I don't know if this is higher powers or coincidence, but for the first time in my life in 2007, 2008, my private buddies in town were the Western ambassadors. It just worked out that way. Before, I had maybe one friend or two, but that year was the Irish ambassador, the Italian ambassador, the French ambassador, um, American ambassador. So I quickly went to the American embassy, and Ambassador John Cloud arranged for Joe Bosky to give a big certificate of honor at a beautiful little ceremony to Fania Bransovsky on April 30th of 2008. Um, uh, I, I will never know if this is related or not, but less than a week later, two armed plainclothes police from the prosecutor's office came to the official residence of Rocco Margolis, who was in Israel, uh, with a piece of paper saying that the prosecutor needed to interview her in a war crimes investigation against Fania Brantzos. Um, in late May of 2008, the prosecutor issued a press release that has still not been retracted, saying we cannot find them. These two women are fugitives, and the internet to this day in Lithuania is full of references. The Jews are hiding their law criminals, and the world says nothing. Now let me tell you, anybody, if I can revert to my native Brooklynese, 
Anybody with half a brain could find these two women in five minutes with the telephone book, with the Jewish community, with the list of survivors, with the organization of uh, ghetto survivors in Lithuania. They don't want to find them. If you find them, you have to have charges. And if you don't find them, you can have a pre-trial investigation, and they can be sent to eternity. Remember, they're in the late 80s. Uh, suspects in a war crimes investigation. What's going on here? Very sadly simple. It's a dirty trick to be able to write in 10 or 20 years. Our prosecutors equally investigated Nazi and Soviet uh, suspects, but alas, they all died before our investigations were complete. In other words, this is a very sophisticated, complicated, and upmarket operation. This is not yelling, use the house on the street. The, the Irish ambassador, Donald Denham, he says, never mention my name without telling them I am not Donald. I am Donald, D-O-N-A-L. Um, he said that cheap American only gave her a piece of paper. Well, I'm going to make her a banquet. And he made a big banquet in the Irish um, ambassador's residence. Um, there were complaints against him from the Lithuanian Foreign Ministry. And in response, Ireland, to its great credit, extended his tenure in Vilnius for an extra year till 2010. Um, it was a beautiful, beautiful evening that ended with all the, uh, the Western diplomatic community singing with Fania the partisan hymn, the Zognit came all as to gaze the next neck, never say that you are going the last way. Um, in June of 2008, Sarah Gnight, a professor in Canada, um, was told by her lawyer to tear up her ticket because she's on the list of war crime suspects because of her book. And by then, the line that finally reading all our books spread, I know another Holocaust survivor in Canada who said, I'm going to send them my books. <laughs> I'm jealous. They're not reading mine. <laughs> now, in June of 2008, the Lithuanian parliament passed a ban on Nazi and Soviet symbols. It's not maybe that unexpected that BBC, this is from the BBC website, would have had a headline Lithuanian ban on Soviet symbols because that was the sensation. Ban on Nazi symbols we know. Now, why would you have a ban on Soviet symbols when nobody in the country wants the Soviet Union ban? Nobody is marching with Soviet symbols. The only people this hurt were very old veterans of the war against Hitler who loved and continue to love to dress up in their uniforms once a year on May 9th to celebrate the victory over Hitler and are now afraid to do so publicly. At the same time, the then president of Lithuania gave interviews that Germany is forgiven, but the Soviet Union is not forgiven so much for equality uh, locally. In August, the Jewish community was, uh, building was defaced uh, more harshly than ever before. That's the gallows with the Star of David. Oh, sorry, that's jumping the gun. Um, again, Yiddish humor seemed to blossom spontaneously. Whoever I met that day in Vilna of the Jewish community, David, of course they will never find the culprits. They are too busy looking for Fania and the oh. <laughs> So the humor continues despite the declining moral situation. I have to say, the elderly Jewish community has been shaken by all this. When that Nazi parade, that first one in the center of town, took place on, um, in March of 2008, I recall I had my weekly Yiddish reading circle, which is a delightful combination of elderly Jews and young students of all backgrounds, mostly Lithuanians, and the oldsters, the lovely seniors who always fight with each other. I want to read. No, I want to read. He didn't mean Nobody wanted to read. What's the matter? I found, finally, you didn't hear what happened yesterday? I said, yes, I heard. For them, it was not some small thing that Juden Raus is, is, is beaming through the streets of the city with police uh, escort. Now, that same Respublica in January 2009 started with um, uh, this series of cartoons of the Jew and the gay holding up the world under the headline, Who Runs the World? Um, if anybody wants to take pictures, that's fine, but all these images are on the website defendinghistory.com, so you can oh. you need to worry about it. There's nothing here that's not there. Um, it was accompanied by an article that the Jews and gays, especially in America, have gotten together 
to figure out how to sink the Lithuanian economy. There's nothing else on their mind. <laughs> you know, and I remember I was sitting having a pizza, because my diet always starts tomorrow, and I'm looking at the next table, and I see someone reading this, and you know, I, I couldn't resist. I went up to him and I said in my rather poor Lithuanian, what do you think of it? He said, oh, oh. <laughs> he said, not you, it's not you. I said, no, it's not me. I'm just, he said, yeah, it's a newspaper, it's a cartoon, it's funny, whatever, different reactions, of course. Now, this is important to freedom of speech and democracy. A very brave Lithuanian journalist, Andrus Navitskas, bless him, spoke up. One guy in the country spoke up. He wrote a big article, and he actually went to the press commission to complain. And what was the result of all that? First of all, they sued him for interfering with freedom of the press with his complaint. But the second thing that happened was the cartoon was again put on the front page of another newspaper, Genios, that means news, with his face and body uh, put into the, the, um, the, the gay and the Jew uh, caricature. That comes from one line in his article. He said, today I am a Jew and a gay. So yeah, you want to be a Jew and a gay? You got it, man. After that, nobody said a word. That was the end of civil discourse on this topic. Then there were any excuse to put the cartoon back. Mm -hmm. Then there was an article that the Jews and gays are now conspiring to bring the editor's head on a platter and destroy him and his newspaper. But that's the original Jew and gay, not Davidskas. So we at least were relieved at that. Um, from June 2009, there were discussions in the press and in Parliament about a law to um, criminalize the opinion that Nazi and Soviet crimes are not the same. In other words, if I say, as I do, Soviet crimes were horrendous, they need to be taught, exposed, and justice needs to be done, but they are not the same as the Holocaust, as genocide. That opinion, according to this proposal, would have been punishable by up to three years imprisonment. Now, it was only a discussion at the time. Uh, meanwhile, there were a new spate of articles in the mainstream press. This one is Lithuanian law being corrected by, and in a slightly larger font, Shidai, the Jews, and the, the article claims that the Jews are conspiring to take away the culture ministry building. Um, as it happens, that building is not one of the pre-war Jewish communal buildings. It was a Jewish private bank before the war. Uh, bank in Vilna, nobody would take it away. And to make it a more classy photo, it was photoshopped to be a round building. It's actually the flat building in the middle of the flat. Never mind. Um, I was feeling very guilty that for all the honors we're doing for Fania, we can't do much for Rojo. Rachel Margolis stuck in her little wooden uh, hut in, in Rehovo. The Lithuanian ambassadors couldn't mix in something in Israel. The ambassadors in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem were not interested. So we made an evening uh, in honor of her in June of 2009. And second from the left is my dear friend Chen Ivri, the Israeli ambassador at the time to the Baltics, who had to make a point that he's there as a private citizen with his own resources because he didn't have instructions from the uh, Israeli government. I can talk about the geopolitics a little later in the questions. That's the head of our community, 82-year-old elected uh, uh, head of the Jewish community, Dr. Shimon al -Kurovic, slightly photoshopped and superimposed over a Soviet abacus. Uh, counting the money of the Lithuanian people that he is planning to steal. Okay, um, coming to me now, the world doesn't say a word about any of this because it's covered by Jewish events and festivals and Yiddish and all kinds of glorious things. We'll come to that. Okay, in May of 2010, the a Lithuanian court ruled that there's going to be one little exception to that 2008 law forbidding Nazi and Soviet symbols, the swastika. The swastika is an ancient Baltic symbol. It's our nationhood. It's the sun. It's the moon. It's the universe. Um, that you can see from the photograph that that's not May because the case evolved over that particular demonstration in February of uh, 2009 in Kleitman. That was classic uh, swastikas taken from interwar uh, artistic and other works in Germany and elsewhere that were pre um, pre World War II to demonstrate that it's an older symbol. In 2010, and we're getting closer now to the present, 
um, a law was passed in Hungary when the right-wing government won the elections forbidding communists, forbidding the opinion that uh, communism and Nazism are not equal, that they're different. In other words, if you say there was only one genocide here, you can get three years. Well, it took only a week or so for the news to spread like wildfire in Lithuania, and in June 2010, the law was passed, but not with three years in prison, only two years in prison, and the president of Lithuania proudly announced that her good offices had mitigated the law and had made it uh, more in tune with mainstream uh, Europe. So trivialization of international crimes, blah, blah, and so on, and that was the vote. Okay, um, we've had a lot of diplomatic success in Europe starting in November, and this wasn't easy, but the British ambassador, after a long, long period of work, got a letter to the um, leaders of Lithuania with the sentence, spurious attempts are made to equate the uniquely evil genocide of the Jews with Soviet crimes against Lithuania, which though great in magnitude, cannot be regarded as equivalent to either intention or result. Signed by the ambassador of Britain, Estonia, Finland, France, Netherlands, Norway, and Sweden, not the USA. America refused to sign. And if you want, we can get into the geopolitics of how everything has changed with the new administration. But Estonia yeah. signed. Yes, that's the second sensational point. Yes. So, being me, I couldn't resist uh, taking to lunch some middle-level person from the Estonian embassy who told me off, 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 off the record, you know, I think they're beginning to decide in Poland that it's more fun to be considered part of the Nordic countries <laughs> than the Baltic countries. So that alliance has begun to crack with Estonia. Um, and in December, um, the uh, latest resolution was rejected by the European Commission. Um, the resolution was demanded by a letter from six foreign ministers. It was supposed to be seven but the Estonian foreign minister came too late to Vilnius a day, a day later. And the Vilnius, and then in the, in the Lithuanian press, the foreign ministry was being pestered. Why didn't Estonia sign? And the reason was there was a blizzard and he got here too late. So we don't know if it's a diplomatic blizzard, but this was the Stockholm Declaration. So now you understand why so many people in Europe hate this whole European Union with all kinds of declarations and proclamations and <laughs> manifestatias and proclamatias. Shalom Aleichem would have known what to do with it. Um, that, that, that's very removed from everyday life because many Europeans don't even bother voting for the European Parliament. You vote in your national and local elections. So anyway, we have stalled their efforts a little bit in the European Parliament. Um, but in December, the Lithuanian Human Rights Association, that's an affiliate of the Helsinki <coughs> group, released a statement that they start to require the sentencing of the citizens of the Jewish nationality, Yitzhak Arad, Fania Bransovsky, and Rachel Margolis, as these citizens, former Soviet guerrillas, have organized the massive slaughter of civilians in the <coughs> new high village. In other words, try convicted, and there have still been no charges, let alone a trial. So if that's what the Lithuanian Human Rights Association is saying, God help the rest of us, and where on earth are the American historians and the American diplomats in the United States and the rest of the world? And we can talk about the geopolitics of this a little later. That's an annual holiday where uh, people dress up as gypsies and Jews, and usually the Jews are throwing fake money around. Um, the neo-Nazi march this year, just over a month ago, grew to over a thousand and included a member of parliament and a senior official of the Genocide Research Center that had just organized a conference in Vilnius in partnership with, among others, the American Embassy in Lithuania and the Holocaust Museum in Washington. So what does that mean, that the Holocaust Museum in Washington Tolerate any of this? No. It means that various naive individuals, leaders, came to Vilnius for a day or two, were given the royal treatment. They saw a choir of students crying about the Holocaust, agreed to fund the conference, and are oblivious and don't want to hear about uh, any unpleasantness. That's another, another fascist symbol now, very popular. Um, and the same day, Juden Raus was uh, 
fated in light on the synagogue. In Latvia and Estonia, you had Waffen SS groups formed after the murder of most of the Jews, but with many of the murderers joining them. And in any case, Waffen SS, part of the Hitler effort, is hardly anything to celebrate, and that grew to 3,000 participants. But in Latvia, with a a hefty Russian-speaking community, there's always opposition, and there's an opposition press. Um, taking the story up to the present, 12th of April, what's that, two days ago, Algirdas Paletskis is put on trial under the new law, but not about the Holocaust. This was done very cleverly. Paletskis is the one far left, far, far left pro-Soviet uh, politician in all of this. His grandfather was Paletskis, who was uh, installed as the puppet Soviet prime minister in 1940. But they didn't mention his comments about the Holocaust. They mentioned his, in my opinion, ridiculous comments about January 1991, where he denies that Soviet forces killed those peaceful demonstrators in Vilnius, which they did on January 13, 1991. So they got him on that, but the law is enough to scare anybody from speaking, and the press has gone to town over one Jewish guy from Latvia who came to support him. Okay, that's Joseph Koren, one of the leaders of the Jewish community of Latvia, who doesn't necessarily agree with him, but has been demonized uh, today and yesterday in the press for uh, supporting uh, Paletskis in that trial. Um, that we can come back to if you want to ask elderly survivors and what they think of all this, but perhaps I don't want to postpone your questions and discussion for too long. I spoke, I speak to Rachel Margolis every week, and she was thrilled that I'm coming to Nev Haven. <laughs> you all heard of Nev Haven. And she has one big request. If you come to Israel, please visit her. It's a 25 minute, 30 minute taxi ride from central Tel Aviv. Um, former Prime Minister Gordon Brown wrote an article in The Independent, the big newspaper in London, where he dedicated a, one of his series to women of courage to Rachel Margolis. So there's something very strange that the former prime minister of speaking up on this whole issue, mentioning how it's shameful that the lady is afraid to return to her home country, where Jewish organizations, Holocaust organizations, museums won't say a word, and that's her during my last visit to her saying hi. I'll just finish with a sort of summary of what's going on. What is this complicated new policy? I want to stress that I am not claiming it's a conspiracy. It's not a conspiracy to anybody following it that has been very, very open. Don't deny a single death. You say 200,000 were killed in the Okay. Somebody else says 211,000. Okay. Suddenly, Holocaust denial in that. Um, uh, eradicate a social, intellectual, or politically dissident class. So if you redefine all that, sure, everything is genocide, everybody committed genocide. So then it becomes true by law. And if you disagree, you're violating the law. Uh, Soviet crimes are raised to the level of genocide because they didn't take every crime under the sun. They took Soviet crimes, deportation, imprisonment, and all of the bad things that the Soviets did. But locally, as you remember from that museum, the Holocaust is not mentioned. The Soviet genocide is only the only one mentioned. And always stress the alleged Jewish participants in Soviet wrongs. There was uh, a big thing over a unit of KGB people from the 50s who had indeed deported uh, many innocent people to Siberia. And of that unit, there were 25 survivors, 24 uh, ethnic Lithuanians, and one Jew who had moved to Israel. So guess who the prosecutors asked to bring to trial? Nachman Dushansky of Israel. And so that, and Israel refused on the grounds that he's being singled out. Um, local Holocaust murderers are glorified as anti Soviet heroes throughout this region. And in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, we're coming to June 23rd, 2011 the 70th anniversary when there were many, many events, including a film with some very prestigious Western and Jewish participation, uh, naive, or Western and Jewish, in my view, participation, glorifying them. Um, Delegitimized efforts to bring Nazi war criminals to justice. Uh, I mentioned Dr. Ephraim Zorov, who I had barely heard of when I moved to Lithuania. I was told that he's in his late 80s, a bitter Holocaust survivor who lost his 
his wife and children who comes to Lithuania to say that all Lithuanians are murderers. And people told me they liked me because I'm not Zoraf, as I mentioned earlier. When I met him, it was at a Yom HaAtzma'ut, Israeli Independence Day celebration in spring 2000. I saw a middle-aged guy laughing and joking with a bunch of Lithuanian officials in a deep Brooklyn accent. So I walked up to him, excuse me, sir, are you from Brooklyn, New York? How do you do it, Ephraim Zoraf? I said, no, no, it can't be. So Zorofas has become the symbol of the ugly Jew who is out to find Lithuanian murderers. I remember vividly some of his press conferences in Vilnius where a reporter asked, why do you dislike Lithuania? And he said, I don't dislike Lithuania. I am asking for Lithuania to give a fair trial to someone accused of killing thousands of Lithuanian citizens and to have that trial in a Lithuanian court Lithuanian language, with a Lithuanian judge, under the Lithuanian flag, how does that translate to this flag? But you can understand the two sides of, of, of that. Um, okay, in the partisan movement, criminalize only the Jewish component. The prosecutor has not mentioned any of the surviving veterans of the partisan movement. Yeah? This is a very big topic, investment in Jewish and Yiddish projects and in a certain kind of Holocaust education. So Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, organizations in Britain, many fine and honorable men and women have been duped to cover for all that's going on with lavishly financed Holocaust conferences, education programs, uh, and so on. And Yiddish is especially popular because, of course, Yiddish is native to that part of the world and it's quite easy to find Yiddish scholars who are thrilled that there's a government in the world that likes Yiddish and will invest in Yiddish, so it's very easy to populate these programs and courses, especially painful for those of us who've invested a lifetime in serious Yiddish studies. A very sensitive point is this one, showering foreign Jewish personalities with honor, junkets, grants, and then it becomes difficult to say, I was naive, I was a Schmendrick, and I should have seen. It's much easier to say, ah, everything is fun. OK, at the same time, the state has to compensate with a big part of the electoral base, especially in rural areas, by letting that local, old-fashioned anti-Semitism run rampant. And now, something I didn't discuss yet, and that is, again, a topic for a whole different presentation, but it goes to the heart of it. Many Lithuanian, Latvian, Estonian, Polish, Hungarian, Czech supporters of the double, double genocide movement are really not personally anti-Semitic. Um, but they are convinced that they found the knife, the sword, to fix their geostrategic position. Very simple. Turn Russia into Hitler. If Nazism and communism are equal, well, then Russia, as the heir, the successor state to the Soviet Union, should for 50 years be a pariah, should pay massive reparations to all these countries, should not be permitted to have armed forces outside the country. And let's be very straight, these countries have every reason to feel nervous on the rim of Putin's Russia with its very unclear future. I'm simply objecting to abuse of the Holocaust and revision of history, but that does explain in part the investment. And don't forget that the new Berlin Wall, the new east-west border, is the one that's immediately to the east of the Baltic countries uh, in this area. And disseminate a particular variety of post-Holocaust anti-Semitism. I mentioned it before, we love American Jews and Israelis and British Jews. We hate the local Jews because in their heart of hearts, they think that Lithuanian neighbors of their family committed most of the murders in their family towns and that they are alive today directly or because they or their parents or their grandparents were saved by the Russians, which is objectively accurate in that part of the world where there were no American or British or Canadian forces fighting Hitler uh, during the Holocaust. So that's the, and that anti-Semitism has many, many tangents and strings attached to it. For example, Lithuania has only about 3,000 Jews now, most of them in their 80s. It's easy to convince foreign diplomats and Jewish leaders you know, 
we do the best we can for them, but they'll soon disappear. Let's preserve the great pre-war heritage as we are recognizing everybody suffering equal in an egalitarian spirit of double genocide. Okay, the, the bold Lithuanian intellectuals who've spoken out have either lost their employment or not been promoted or encouraged to leave, but it's a career breaker. Persuade the European Parliament, citing Jewish consent, to replace the Holocaust with a history of two equal evils. If Ephraim, Zorov, Dover, Katz, and three or four other guys from Brooklyn are the only people complaining, then obviously there's nothing you know, serious in it. Where is the American Jewish Congress? Where, where are the elected representatives? Who, uh, where is the Jewish lobby? Where is Israel? Okay, restitution issues are manipulated to keep intra-Jewish conflict going. And uh, as an American, I have to say that there's also a lot of rubbishing of the entire uh, anti-Nazi war effort of the Allies. Ah, it was a bunch of evils, everybody was killing everybody, so that this is something very important that I think American, Canadian, British, and other patriots should be concerned about, the, the rubbishing of the anti-Nazi war effort. So my recommendations are that the victims of communism should be honored and the crimes exposed as separate issues. Second, people should ask elected representatives to speak up against those resolutions and against the continuing campaign uh, of defamation of the survivors. Western foundations, museums, and academics should be warned, and there needs to be an online Holocaust studies library on the internet that uh, is based on a town where people can press a button and look up any town in the Holocaust map of Europe and to see what happened and indeed who the perpetrators were. You're all invited, despite all that, to a two-week Jewish-Lithuania program in Vilnius that is not under the auspices of the Lithuanian government or its institutions. And any questions and discussions or disagreements will be very happy. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. So, okay. So, um, Dominic, first of all, thank you very much. Uh, thank you really. Thank you for bringing to life an intricate and complicated subject in such a clear manner. So we have we have about half an hour for Q and A. Um, so you can yeah. go ahead, and then uh, if people just sort of look at me, I'll acknowledge you. Several years ago, we visited you in Vilnius, and a member of, uh, I think, faculty there, lady, very courageously wrote a paper about a particular action in the Lithuanian town where she named names, and if I recall, she was ostracized. Could you tell us what happened to her, how she made out finally? Uh, I don't want to get personal about anybody. Uh, I will say that one or two people in that situation have sadly been pressured to abandon their loyalty to historic truth and to go along with the current who I'm very sorry to say. I don't blame anybody. People are worried about their families, their careers, their futures. But when somebody has written and published something, it's there forever. And um, I'm proud to have on the website defendinghistory.com a page called Gold Citizens, where you will find such papers starting with Ben Slavis' 1975 essay and going up to an article, a very brave article written yesterday. Uh, and so, uh, if I can ask a question, I think there's, uh, there seems to be a Yale connection. Because I think uh, Tim Snyder's book, Bloodlands, which is, uh, being, is receiving a lot of attention, I think a lot of critical acclaim. Um, mm -hmm. In a sense, could you relate his work to this situation? Because he, he said, I recently, I started reading the book, I haven't mm -hmm. finished it, but he gave a lecture last week where he said he made two contentions, which I think in a very sophisticated mm -hmm. way sort of legitimized the uh, obfusc obfuscation yeah. of, uh, of the, two, the two evils merging yeah. together. He looks at it uh, in a methodological way. He approaches it from a territorial perspective. So he carves out space, and all this murder and destruction happened in the space, and that's how he perceives it. Um, and at the same time, he said something which quite shocked me. He said that the Holocaust, that, that anti-Semitism cannot explain the Holocaust. It's part of the sort of territorial war warfare. So in a very sophisticated way, I would say it's not Holocaust denial, but it's this sort of uh, um, watering down the vision of history. So can you relate this work to it? And, and I think as a, as a caveat to it, He's receiving a lot of acclaim even within sort of Holocaust studies and Jewish history because he pays a lot of attention to survivors. He treats them with great respect, people who suffered in the Soviet and people who uh, suffered under the Nazis and their, um, 
satellites, so can you speak right. to that issue? Sure. I think in America you always say you start with what? full disclosure. Last September, the Guardian newspaper in its American edition separately invited Ephraim Zorf and myself to answer an article by Tim Snyder, and we did. And he then answered back. It was a very friendly <coughs> civic debate. You can uh, find it all somewhere on the front page of DefendingHistory.com, where uh, I disagree very strongly with Professor uh, Snyder's uh, views. I then read the book. It's a very important book. It's a very well-written book. It corrects many misconceptions. For example, he demonstrates how most of the killing of the Holocaust took part uh, in Eastern Europe by shooting and not by the names in, in, in the uh, most famous uh, concentration camps. And it's uh, a very important book in many ways. But I think it does have a moral failing in that there is too much equalization of all kinds of crimes with the planned destruction of an entire people that is carried out in force in any part of the world where your forces gain power, which is where the Holocaust is. Um, I recently had a debate in the uh, Lithuanian Journal of Foreign Affairs on this topic, and I said to my uh, friendly opponent, let's travel together from the east to the west and the north to the south of Lithuania, I bet you'll find Lithuanians, Poles, Russians, Belarusians of all ages and sizes. But in all these towns, you won't find a single Jew because there was genocide and they were all killed. The Lithuanian population <coughs> suffered enormously under Soviet rule and it did not suffer genocide. The population grew under Soviet rule. So I am fearful that Kosher books, and Tim's book is certainly kosher, there's no anti-Semitic intention, there's no far-right intention, uh, is fitting in very conveniently. And uh, I said to him over a, our very amicable lunch today in, in New Haven that um, in, in the far-right uh, community in Vilnius, the name Snyder is now thrown out as one of the great heroes that he proved the equality of Nazi and Soviet crime, although he never puts it that way in the book. So what I would like to see is an open critical discussion where major specialists, historians, and archivists come out with a second opinion. And I am a little bit alarmed that that second opinion seems to be lacking here in the United States where nobody will lose their job or tenure for disagreeing. So um, it's, uh, I think we need to be much more robust. In, um, in keeping our eyes on it. Of course, to give you an example, if you take certain parameters arbitrarily of geography and of time, you can come up with 70 million people murdered and, uh, and not even a tenth, but it isn't about that. It's about the destruction of every man, woman, child of this people, the destruction of a people uh, carried out. Um, so I'm very worried about the way his book and others is now uh, being used and going to be used by the obfuscationists in Europe and by the new far right in Eastern Europe who have successfully masqueraded as centrist or center right to naive Western uh, diplomats and, and leaders. And um, so yeah, I hope um, Tim will, will think about this more. I advised him when he said, what, what, I said he could issue a statement uh, denouncing a lot of what's going on in Eastern Europe and make it very clear that this is not at all his intention and constitutes a misuse. Two questions. The first one is you mentioned that the United States did not sign the uh, yeah. rejection. You said that you would discuss it later. Yeah, fine. Okay, thank you. Well, let's do one at a time because I have a short memory. And I will. Okay. Uh, I have many ways of telling the story, so I'll tell it like a guy from Brooklyn. Some years ago, the American ambassador under the Bush administration took me to lunch, and he says, David, you look to me like an old-fashioned New York liberal type. <laughs> I think the only defense I could come up with is that yes, but my family always voted for Nelson A. Rockefeller and John D. Vincent, and we knew what the A and the V stood for. Anyway, and he said to me, I'm a lifelong Republican and I want you to remember this. He said, I have been tough on Russia and the Soviet Union and communism all my life, so I have no problem telling our Baltic partners where to get off 
when they abuse Soviet crimes for Holocaust denial, anti-Semitism, or wacky nationalism. I vividly remember those three phrases as he put it. Well, you may have read, I don't know how many follow this, the Bush administration had promised to put missiles in Poland and radar interceptors in the Czech Republic. I know it's all ancient history now. And Russian President Medvedev was going to retaliate by putting his missiles in Kaliningrad, the Russian enclave that's between, that's, that you know, borders Lithuania and, and Poland. Well, I thought my Lithuanian friends and colleagues would be alarmed. Missiles on both sides. No, it was yippee! It's the new Cold War. We're important and we're safe and we're secure because there are missiles here. And it's good that the Russians have missiles because then we'll get more missiles. Then after the election, President Obama canceled those missiles. President Medvedev canceled his missiles. And I, being the naive guy I am, thought that everybody would celebrate that they're not living with nuclear missiles on both sides. There, were, there was a mood throughout the country of total betrayal. Obama, the bastard Obama, has sold out. He's selling us to the Russians. Now, um, that's so far what I heard. The rest of what I'm going to tell you is diplomatic chit-chat from many lunches on the diplomatic circuit, many uh, cocktail parties where, where even diplomats speak too much after a certain amount of, of excellent Lithuanian vodka. And <laughs> the story goes that instructions came from Washington that we have so upset the countries in this part of the world with canceling the missiles Let's not make an issue of anything else. That is what the talk is. I don't know if that's correct or whether that explains the full truth of it. There's more to it. There are major leaders of American Jewish organizations who over the years have become completely, in my view, bamboozled and brainwashed by their visits and medals and honors and everything else, and that has also played a role. Yeah. Okay, a second question? Well, okay. Or one at a time. Make it short. Did you make it quick? No. No. Okay. <laughs> so we'll try to come back. And then you'll come back. Yeah. Anybody else would like to ask a question? Anybody else? Yes. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, you gave us examples of uh, legal provisions uh, penalizing Holocaust denial and uh, denial of the crimes of Soviets. Are you opposing them because they put both of those crimes or denial of those crimes in one provision or you are just against in general. Personally, today, in 2011, I'm against, in, in, for example, in Eastern Europe, the criminalization of any free speech. I would not, personally, personally speaking today, criminalize Holocaust denial. As we see what's happened with this law, there was an um, investigation of a notorious Holocaust denier, Stankeras, and they decided not to prosecute. But when it came to uh, somebody from the other side, they are prosecuting. So, um, but what I object to is that the um, red-brown equivalence is built into the law, Nazi and Soviet genocide. So if I believe that the Soviet crimes are awful, terrible, need to be punished, as I do, by the way, um, I am violating the law in the opinion of the parliamentarians and lawyers I have spoken to. So I object both to the restriction of freedom of speech and to the legalized equalization of Nazi and Soviet crimes as part of this much wider movement. And it has led to a decline of civic debate. The victims of this are the Lithuanian people, especially and the Latvians and others, because in those countries, even without a law, it hurts your career to disagree with double genocide now. If it's made into one of the pillars of society and of defense and of foreign policy, I think it's very sad that free debate is life. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm wondering, um, I mean, you, you told us about the efforts of the uh, Lithuanian government uh, to uh, equate the uh, Holocaust and the Soviet crimes and whatever. Um, what is your, um, how do you think, what is uh, the future perspectives or the outlook on a supranational level, uh, talking of European Union, Will they succeed in this, uh, uh, their efforts to equate these two uh, crimes? If the opposition remains in the hands of two, three individuals, of course they will succeed. 
Now, I'm, I'm talking about a European Union. In the European Parliament, yes. Yeah. It, so far, this has gone under the radar. Okay. The various bodies, governments, scholars who we would expect to stand up are not standing up for a variety of reasons. And there's a great variety of reasons. People are busy with other things, don't think the issue is so important, uh, all kinds of reasons. Some people, as I say, have been uh, co-opted by massive hospitality grants and the rest. So this, when a government, when, when a group of countries spends a lot of state treasure on this and there's no opposing force, um, it's a very difficult situation. And yes, I do fear that there will be more success of the Red Brown Movement, although we've had a, a, a little bit of turnaround. Yeah, there's a lot of, lots of members of parliament who I mean, from France, from Germany, yeah. from huge countries, from the UK, from Spain, and mm -hmm. Italy, and whatever. Place, um, are they neutral? Or, or many of them couldn't care less, and many of the hundreds who signed the April 2009 declaration about the uh, 23rd of August had no idea what the background is, and many of them are shocked now when they learn even one-fifth or one-tenth of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. But without funding, Without an office in Brussels, this is not going to become a viable opposition. Okay. You need somebody to invest in it. It can't be one or two or three individuals who can easily be dismissed as mavericks, eccentrics, and so on. It has to have a basis of support. Yeah. If anybody has to leave, don't worry. Please, uh, wherever you have to. Yeah, any other? Anyone? Yeah, okay. Um, we were in Palin uh, a few years back, and I vividly remember the tour guide saying that the, Rus the Russians attacked us, and then the Nazis attacked us, and they, it struck me as strange. A political party does not invade another con a, a country. It's a country invades another country. And what's happening is that even you yourself are equating Nazism, you say Soviet, you say Russia, and then you say Nazi. And uh, I find this a little, uh, this is part of revisionist history. So yeah. now, realizing that they have more uh, German tourists, they say Nazi. Because now the Germans can say, it wasn't us, yeah. it was the Nazis, and of course the Nazis came from Mars. So, uh, <laughs> I basically agree with you. Uh, what's happened here is that the powerful side of this debate has set the terms and terminology of the debate. And after all these resolutions, we also have to mention both in the same breath a new sentence to answer, and that's a big problem. And then, from what I see here with uh, uh, Estonia and Latvia and Lithuania, mm -hmm. is they were really Hitler's willing executioners. If you read yes. Ordinary Men, yeah. They were, I think they were called the Kiwis, and they were the most brutal and sadistic mm -hmm. of all the, uh, 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 I, I, uh, whatever they were, yeah. the, the, the execution squads that were sent into Poland and then Russia. Mm -hmm. And so what you have here, what them pushing uh, for uh, equality, is they're covering their own tracks. Absolutely. Well, as I said early on, it's because the murder rate was the worst in Europe, and that because of massive voluntary participation in the killing, there is this ultranationalist desire to write that out of history because an ultranationalist doesn't want any stain on his or her history. At the same time, let us never condemn the entire Lithuanian or Latvian or Estonian peoples. Even the maximal number of 23,000 participants in the murders in Lithuania, which is horrific, bad enough, is whatever, 1% or less of the population. So it, it must never be a condemnation of a race, a people, a nation, and we must never forget the incredible bravery in that part of the world of those who just did the right thing and hit somebody. But the major trend is absolutely correct, as you But you yes. call this defending history because you're defending the truth, the principle of truth. Because none of the few thousand Jews, their lives are not actually in any way right. in danger. Right. So it's not defending people, it's defending... That's right. You know, just, just saying the record yeah. straight and keeping history... And the of honesty and truth, which is a great point. I mean, just, you know, but they're not in any trouble. Nobody has been killed or physically assaulted. The 
uh, the Nazi marches and the defacing of Kivirian and Senegal buildings has been the worst of it so far, the cartoons. Um, so by defending history, I mean first exactly what you are saying, Rachel, that it's defending the historic truth, the historic record against a very complex, sophisticated assault that is slowly insinuating its way into North American academia, where even the top scholars who have absolutely not an anti-Semitic or racist or far-right bone in their body are also going along with this general postmodernist mush of everything is the same. The second uh, point of defending history is defending the field of history and, and thought and free speech as being a free enterprise between competing scholars, students, schools of thought, and not dictated by the state with the criminalization of the non-state. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, uh, what does this hold for the future? Uh, the fact that this is a continually creeping phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, looking in your crystal ball, what do you see? Okay. Um, now I'm doing the crystal ball. Huh? No facts, all crystal ball. I see the far right gaining ascendancy in a big part of the European Union and NATO nations of Eastern Europe, succeeding to a great extent in um, blunting any opposition from the West, succeeding in disguising it as mainstream, I see them becoming ultra-nationalist, largely homogeneous nations. I don't see it leading to any massacres or, or at this time. I don't see it leading to any uh, great violence, and I hope I'm right on that point. Um, I also see the Holocaust being successfully written out of history to the delight of the anti-Semitic uh, um, elites in many of these countries, and this is because of the failure of Western academia, Jewish academia, Israeli academia, to stand up. So if anybody knows an elected representative who'll say something about this, thank you in advance. But the crystal ball is that the Jewish communities will soon be demographic zero, not, God forbid, absolute zero. There'll be the few hundred, what's, what's it called, a caretaker community. But because there was one genocide, there is one extinct race, a few hundred caretakers notwithstanding. And so with the disappearance of the Jewish communities, that element will fall out of it. And the revisionists, with their huge Western support, are winning this battle big time. So on a note, uh, yeah. Happy a note next time. Yeah. Okay. So David, thank you very much for doing thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Charles, for all your customers. I have a very small question. Sure. Uh, if anyone has to go, just. I mean, why do we know so little about this? I mean, I um, keep myself informed as much as I can, uh, including from several Jewish uh, lists and organizations, and it's it's not a topic. It's not a topic. It's been successfully kept off the agenda by this big investment by the Baltic governments and other governments in the area in getting Western and Jewish support, or at least silence. Imagine if the Holocaust Museum participates in Holocaust conferences there without mentioning any of these issues. Um, something's very wrong. So I hope it... Well, I'm bamboozled by, by your presentation. I'm just you know, sort of in shock. Um, the two websites to look at are Operation Last Chance, which is the, uh, the website of the Wiesenthal Center's uh, Israel office, especially under Lithuania, the many articles by Ephraim Zorov. And I try to put as much as I can on defendinghistory.com. I don't know how long I'll be able to continue that website as some kind of eccentric lone ranger. None of this is going to, none of this little opposition that exists now is going to survive if some organization or country or um, institute with means doesn't pick it up. Yeah. How much is, uh, how much of what you told here today uh -huh. is known to official Israeli authorities? Everything. Everything. The foreign ministry, yes. Because, okay. because oh. neither on the news or... Mm -hmm. No, no, yeah. Yeah. I never I heard such, you know, in such extent because it's disturbing 
when you started talking, I had a comment, and then the comments kind of piled up. Right. But it's disturbing on so many levels that it just Two paralyzes. of those partisans are Israeli citizens. Yitzhak Arad yeah. is an Israeli and citizen. Yeah. Rachel Margolis is a dual Israeli Lithuanian citizen. We all know the extent to which Israel went to get back the remains of two soldiers from Lebanon. Why is Israel allowing two eminent citizens in their late 80s to be sent to eternity as suspected war criminals for having been heroes in fighting Hitler? The answer is that the Israeli Foreign Ministry believes that the Baltic countries are vital and even existential allies for the state of Israel, where there's a lot of left-wing anti-Israel sentiment in the big Western countries of Europe, and that the three votes, and more than three if you count the Czech Republic, that a bunch of votes in the European Union and in, the, in various international organizations are absolutely vital. You can read my friendly or not so friendly or half friendly debate with Barry Rubin, the major expert, a major expert on Middle Eastern affairs on this issue, where Barry Rubin basically says, um, listen, we really need the Baltic states, they want the Prague Declaration, they want double genocide. Ah, it's not important, it's only a few people. So that's been the debate. And you can find all those debates on defendinghistory.com where I try very hard to always put the opinions against our view <laughs> uh, with them. Um, so Israel is in a difficult situation, but I would, of course, have liked to see something more about Yitzhak Arad and others. Uh, so it, it is, to me, a little bit shocking, nonetheless. In other words, they could stay aloof, but didn't have to uh, go as far as they've gone now in supporting the, the, the Baltic position. I can just, on a personal yeah. note, yeah. can sadly say that my own grandmother, mm -hmm. that she lives in Israel for the past 37 years, and she was born in Moscow. Uh -huh. And for all of the Yom HaShoah Holocaust Day in mm -hmm. Israel, which is um, celebrated there, she always like lift her fingers and say, Stalin was worse. Stalin was, because she lived under the communist right. regime, and her own father, right. great grandfather, was actually in the communist uh, government. Uh, well, I would give her a big hug and thank her for coming out with her view, which is her life experience. Exactly. So there's going to be a diversity of views. That's separate from the In issue way, of criminalizing. Like Absolutely. The, Somebody who lived only under communism will have a very different view, and that's completely natural. But um, you've touched on the very sensitive subject of the Holocaust in Israel in general, mm -hmm. and that also relates to some, uh, a point I would like to make that one of the many ways that this has been covered up is with so-called Holocaust studies. They're doing all of this, but they're also investing in a big memorial for Holocaust victims in a big conference. So Israel and America feel they're let off the hook. They're participating in a Holocaust Remembrance Conference. What do you want? And I say, wait a minute. You can't participate, you cannot participate in a Holocaust conference in Vilnius without mentioning Rachel Margolis and Yitzhak Arad and Fania Bratsovsky and Sarah Gnaita and all these other things. You can politely disagree and come back. So that's been the problem, that Holocaust studies and Judaic studies and Yiddish studies have themselves been built up into a massive smokescreen. We can overcome it if we get some more interest from some of you guys. Thank you, Doug. Continue strength in your important work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.